I'm um, David Brenner, the Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences at um, UC San Diego, and thank you for joining us for today's health talk. The topic of today is advances in cardiovascular medicine, and this is very timely because we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Salpizio Cardiovascular Center and Cardiovascular Institute, and our speakers will be um, the um, executive directors of the um, Salpizio Cardiovascular Center and Institute. Um, I want to personally point out what an amazing accomplishment um, Shami Mahmood and Michael Madani have done in bringing us to this level in developing this world-class um, heart care program and um, bringing together physicians from different disciplines and different um, departments to all optimize um, patient care at the highest possible level. And in my opinion, this has really become a model for how we should um, treat patients with other diseases in this um, unique multidisciplinary approach that really um, shows the best of, um, of academic medicine. So today's speakers are going to be the um, Executive Director for Medicine of the Cardiovascular Institute and Chief of the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine, Dr. Shami Mahmood, and the Executive Director for Surgery of the Cardiovascular Institute and Chief of the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery, Dr. Michael Madani. We're also um, very happy to have um, three um, friends of UC San Diego Health join us. Um, the first um, is Steve Strauss, who is a community leader, attorney, and philanthropist and a strong supporter of UC San Diego Health and also a personal friend. And the second are um, uh, two donors and patients of the Salpicio Cardiovascular Center, Kevin and Bernice O'Connor, and they'll be joining us today from Naples, Florida, and we're grateful and excited to have them join us. So we're going to start off um, with Dr. Madani. He will talk about the Salpicio Cardiovascular Center and um, how this has added to the ability to take great care in the community of San Diego. Michael. Dr. Brenner, uh, thank you very much for the warm introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here, and, and I'm particularly delighted for all of you uh, who have joined us. I know some of you are far away, some of you are local, um, and uh, it's, it's just sitting here reflecting back, it's just been an amazing journey over the last uh, 10 years. And I just want to point out that we wouldn't be able to be where we are today without uh, support of, uh, of course, all of you, uh, our friends and um, family in the community, which I would consider a family, as well as uh, our leaders, including Dr. Brenner, our CEOs, uh, and our current dean, uh, Steve uh, Garfin. So it has been an amazing journey. We, um, I remember it very vividly 10 years ago, actually this weekend would be uh, 10 years when, when we rolled the first patient from the old Thornton ICU into the Sulpizio. And the level of excitement that we had that day, I have to say it still continues. We still have that excitement. And that's a testament to, to really the staff and the faculty and the collaboration that we have uh, between our different teams. But uh, before really going into too much detail of what's happened and the institute that has developed, that which we're really proud of, I really would like to um, welcome uh, you know, one of our patients and two of our friends, Bernice and um, uh, Kevin O'Connor are joining us from Florida. And uh, some of you will find this hard to believe, but we'll hear from him. Uh, we'll have a video. And Bernice um, had uh, problems uh, breathing and uh, she's in Florida. And in the middle of the pandemic, uh, you know, they decided to come to San Diego, to come to Silpizio. And they will explain why uh, they did that coming to a new hospital, a new city, traveling in the middle of pandemic. And um, I, I can't wait uh, for you all to see their story and for them to share uh, the story. And I'm really delighted and pleased to say that Bernice today is um, able to carry on a normal full life. So without any further ado, uh, let's go ahead and hear from them. And thank you, by the way, for joining us, both uh, Bernice and Kevin, I know you're there, so thank you. Hi, my name is Bernice O'Connor. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, currently living in Florida. 
thank God I'm here today. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Kevin O'Connor. Uh, I also was from New York and we retired down into Naples, Florida about four years ago. Uh, Bernice was diagnosed uh, almost a year ago. I was brisk walking and I felt uh, short of breath and um, immediately got a, uh, made a doctor's appointment to the, for the uh, pulmonologist. Originally, Bernice was misdiagnosed by a local doctor here, uh, which I found out later is very common uh, with uh, PTE. Uh, so I started to begin research on uh, the extent of the problem, what the potential cures were. And fortunately, we found a really good uh, high profile pulmonologist down here that did accurately diagnose Bernice and recommended the surgery. Uh, once I learned about the surgeries, you know, with, with this particular diagnosis, it is life threatening and uh, ultimately ends up in death at some point. So it's very serious. And clearly when you're doing research about something so serious, you look at success rates, mortality rates, and there's only about six uh, centers around the country that I became aware of and UCSD's success rates were orders of magnitude greater than anybody else in the country. So it became a very kind of clear direction and decision that this was a place we wanted to investigate and head out to, and I'm glad we did. You know, from the minute we met Dr. Madani and his staff and his team, you know, our confidence went way up. I think I told Dr. Madani it was like going from high school football to the NFL. Yes. I never felt unsafe. I felt really secure about everything. And I mean, it was a well-oiled machine. Everything was just so smooth and I have nothing to complain. It was amazing. When I found out I was a candidate for the surgery, needless to say, I was scared and I cried yeah. <laughs> a lot. Right, but, rightfully so. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very, scary feeling not knowing what's going yeah. to happen especially as something that's uh, so serious in nature um but dr madani and his staff were well adept to making you feel very comfortable outlining the procedure the staff at the icu they were also rock stars amazing and i never felt um uncomfortable um it was just the staff that was so friendly caring and um, I didn't feel scared. I was more like, okay, this is it. And I'm ready to get better again. If God forbid anything happened to Kevin, obviously San Diego would be top of the list. In a heartbeat, I would shoot over there. And we've also told as many people as we mm -hmm. can about it because unfortunately the awareness of this particular issue is not uh, very mm -hmm. well known across the country and certainly not here in Florida. So, um, you know, it's one of the things we felt strongly about is we want to do as much as possible and communicate it to as many people as possible. After going through something as serious as this procedure and seeing the commitment that Dr. Madani and his staff had basically day in, day out, dealing with, you know, life and death, literally, uh, Bernice and I discussed it. And we both felt very strongly we wanted to leave a meaningful impact there as much as we could. And we decided to make a donation to UCSD. Very happy we did. We want to continue that. And uh, just the people there really just drove, you know, our behavior toward that end, seeing the commitment that they made day in, day out, whether it was the uh, critical staff nurses. Yeah, the nurses were, they were amazing, yeah. amazing. So the whole experience just drove us to try to do as much as we possibly could for the institution. After my surgery and recovery, um, it was like night and day. I started feeling better each day, stronger each day, and taking a breath, a full breath was amazing without feeling winded, making my bed, or going to one room to another. It was a great feeling. The best part was I couldn't wait to start working out again because I, I love working out. And, you know, I took baby steps, but now I'm full blown. I'm back to normal. I 
I would highly recommend, highly recommend coming here because it they saved my life and I'm here. <laughs> you know, after all said and done, we're just very grateful yeah. to have the opportunity to visit such a stellar facility and be treated yes. so well. Um, we just appreciated every aspect of it and want to show that in every way we can. Thank you, uh, Bernice and Kevin. Um, we're really delighted that you were able to share this story. I'm particularly honored that you're here with us today and I'm honored that uh, you travel to have your care here at San Diego, in San Diego at the Sulpizio. And um, uh, there was a question in the chat to describe the condition, but, and I will do that in a second. But before I do that, I, I wanna just point out that um, for this particular condition, we're known all around the world, but it's not, it's not me or one particular person. The reason this program is so successful is the contribution of an entire group of uh, uh, what we call CTEF team. That includes the pulmonologists, uh, the uh, pulmonary vascular group, our colleagues in cardiology, our colleagues in anesthesia, in particular cardiac anesthesiology, uh, the staff in the operating room, and, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, Shami and I may be the face of uh, the CBI and the program, but behind us is just a fantastic group of people that, uh, that help us uh, get where we're at. Um, you know, after hearing an amazing story like that, it's really easy to go on and talk about different programs and all the accomplishments we've had over the last uh, 10 years. I'd like to just highlight a few things. Um, in particular, the pulmonary endarterectomy program, which was just mentioned, it's part of uh, what we call the CTEF program. It's chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And uh, in a nutshell, it has to do with developing significant high blood, significantly high blood pressures inside your lungs uh, as a result of blood clots that get uh, clogged up um, in the vessels of the lung. So most people, when they get a blood clot, let's say you're sitting down for a long period of time, you're traveling a long distance and you get a blood clot in your lungs, for vast majority of patients, those resolve and they go away. Uh, over 90, 95% of them uh, in particular, if they get blood thinners. But for about somewhere around 5% of the patients, they do not resolve. And like any other injury in, in the body, they become scar tissue. The problem is once that scar tissue is formed inside the vessels, you cannot have blood flow and you get short of breath. You have a sensation of um, pressure and shortness of breath. And, and you know I can't imagine what it's like. I always tell people that it's like working out and when you're out of breath, um, when your heart is racing, it's like feeling like that all the time. And removing the scar tissue is um, uh, pretty complex. It's not um, easily removed. Um, but the operation actually was pioneered in San Diego at UC San Diego um, by people who were here before me, including Ken Moser, uh, who is a pulmonologist, and Nina Bromwald. And then there are many others who really led the program, including uh, Stuart Jameson on the um, uh, surgical side, Kirk Peterson um, on the uh, cardiology medical side, followed by uh, many other individuals. And, and we're here now taking the disease and the program to the next level. And Shami and I, with Nick Kim, who's the head of the pulmonary vascular group, as well as our cardiac anesthesia team, uh, uh, led by uh, Dr. Tim Moths and radiology group, we have developed a multidisciplinary team where actually we're offering multiple different uh, uh, regimens for treatment of this disease. Things have changed. Now we can balloon some of the patients that are not surgical candidates. So Dr. Mahmoud and his team uh, uh, are uh, number one center in the country right now in terms of balloon pulmonary angioplasty. We have medical therapy and uh, surgery, of course, remains number one in the world. Uh, we get referrals from all over the country, including even pediatric patients. Just in the last five weeks, I've operated on three kids at Radies, our partner Radies Hospital, and the kids have come from all over the country with this particular disease. Uh, it's not age limited. You could be as young as seven, six, 
um, year old and as old as 90 year old. And if you get clots in your lungs for whatever reason and they don't resolve, this is the issue that you have. Um, but we started 10 years ago. The program was well known. We've just taken it to the next level. And like many other programs um, uh, in the CVI, it, it did exist to some extent, but um, boy, we're, we're just proud of what has been accomplished. I mean, I can go on down the list. Our heart transplant program um, is now ranked number, uh, right now currently is number two, but the last two years uh, we've been number one and go back and forth between one and two um, in terms of outcomes in the whole country. I mean, that's that's an amazing accomplishment where you consider when we opened the Sulpicio Cardiovascular Center, before we became an institute, um, we were not really ranked. Um, our lung transplant program, similar story. It's number one um, in the country right now in terms of outcome. Uh, the heart transplant program has had many firsts, including very uh, successful program with high risk donors, including hepatitis C, uh, what we call diseased, um, I mean, donor from cardiac death, DCD. Um, and, and, and I could uh, uh, go on that, that list. Um, but we've also had obviously many firsts and um, Dr. Mahmoud will highlight some of those on the cardiology uh, side as well. Uh, we've developed um, uh, robotic surgery, minimally invasive surgery, uh, percutaneous uh, uh, interventions, valve replacements, mitral aortic. And the bottom line is what started as, as a um, vision and a, a dream has really surpassed uh, our expectations. We're not done yet. Like I said, we're still very excited every day coming to work because we're not done yet and we, we have ways to go. But what I'm really particularly proud of is the fact that no one in San Diego currently has to leave to get cardiac care. And we're getting referrals uh, from all over the county, uh, other states, all over the country uh, for cardiac care to be performed here at um, uh, Sulpizio. Um, I'm sure there's going to be uh, uh, other questions uh, that will come on. You know, one other thing that I just want to highlight is this pandemic. The pandemic, of course, take, took a toll um, on all of us. Um, of course, it affected healthcare as well, but our center carried on uh, without without a bump, without a glitch. We were we were as busy as uh, we've always been, and um, we actually uh, developed our mobile ECMO program in the middle of pandemic. So we were one of the centers where we would utilize a team, take a team and take it to other hospitals and put patients on cardiopulmonary bypass, essentially. Patients who were too sick to um, have anything done on the ventilator and we would transfer them here and care for them um, in San Diego. And our mobile ECMO program, and ECMO is essentially like a hard lung machine, um, has become nationally known where people are coming and training with us. Our team is going around the country training other people. So. Um, that's something that just happened in the last year, uh, despite uh, COVID. And it, it just makes us, as the leaders of the program, really, really proud of the type of faculty and dedication from faculty and, and all staff that we see within our multidisciplinary uh, teams. With that, um, again, I will uh, thank uh, Kevin and Bernice uh, for sharing their story and Dr. Brenner I'll uh, pass it on to you. Thank you so much. I also want to thank um, the O'Connors and, and Dr. Madani. That was, was, it was a really <laughs> wonderful story. And thank you um, for sharing that with us. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Shaman Mood, and he's going to tell us about um, the Salpizio Cardiovascular Center and Institute for the, next, for the next 10 years, just to keep you out of trouble, Shaman. Great, thanks Dr. Brenner and Dr. Madani. This is uh, indeed an honor to uh, be here 10 years later after opening of the Sulpizio Cardiovascular Center uh, to be with all of our friends and donors and patients who have joined us. And I'd like to uh, uh, expand a little bit on our successes over the last decade 
Dr. Madani shared some of the programs. In addition, uh, in electrophysiology, we've introduced how to do ablation, not only for atrial fibrillation, but for ventricular tachycardia, a heart rhythm that kills patients. Uh, we've found a way to non-invasively diagnose and our EP team can ablate and treat those. We in interventional cardiology uh, can replace heart valves, can repair heart valves, uh, do complex angioplasty and stent procedures from other when other centers can't do it. This was not the way our center was set up a decade ago. When it comes to cardiac imaging, everybody used to require heart catheterization. We can now do CAT scans and get heart images that are highly, highly accurate. Even though we do over 4,000 uh, heart procedures in the cath labs on an annual basis, we also now do thousands of CAT scans to make those diagnoses. You heard about our heart transplant program. We also have the first preventive cardiology section. Uh, we are thankful to the STEP family for the STEP family uh, cardiac wellness and rehabilitation center. And we have recruited a series of cardiologists that focus on making sure the rest of us go out of business. Uh, the idea is we can do preventive cardiology, preventive cardiovascular health, and that's another new program. So I will touch upon how we're building unique programs and how we're training the next generation. Uh, but prior to that, I'd like to uh, introduce Steve Strauss, one of our friends, patients, donors, and he's also on the director's council of the UCSD Cardiovascular Institute. And uh, Steve has a video to share with us, and I understand him and Lisa are also on the call with us today. So maybe we can queue up uh, the video from uh, Steve Strauss. My name is Steve Strauss. Um, I was born in San Diego, as was my father and our children. So three generations of San Diegans. Uh, I went away for schooling and came back uh, to San Diego to practice law. And I've uh, been involved with UCSD over the years uh, through my family but become more involved, particularly with the medical center, um, based on some of my own experiences. My younger sister, um, Stephanie, passed away from ovarian cancer 15 years ago, and we founded the Stephanie Strauss Ovarian Cancer Clinic. And 10 years ago, uh, I had a cardiac event, completely unex unexpected. And um, when I woke up, I had a defibrillator in, and I came to learn that I had cardiomyopathy. Uh, I didn't know I'd had it. There were no precursors to it. And when I asked um, where I would go to get treated for cardiomyopathy, I was told there was nowhere in San Diego that treated cardiomyopathy, that I would have to go to Stanford or I would have to go to Tufts. Um, I came to meet Dr. Adler, who uh, is very familiar with cardiomyopathy. So I was very fortunate. Uh, I survived my event. I've wanted to learn and study more about uh, the causes of cardiomyopathy and potential cure. So I'm very appreciative of Dr. Adler and both his personal and professional efforts to study and treat this disease, which has uh, taken a lot of lives. And I'm very supportive and uh, amazed at the research that he's doing, which is one of the key underpinnings of um, wanting to found this center. Uh, Dr. Adler has this technique where he's able to take um, skin cells, as he did mine, and put them in a Petri dish and have them convert to beating heart cells. It's a long process, it's still ongoing, but his technique will uh, hopefully replicate the disease in these beating heart cells and allow the study um, through mice and through drug, drug treatment to try and accelerate the time frame for learning about what causes cardiomyopathy and how best to, um, or how to cure it. Uh, Eric and I become very good friends. And, you know, I think an indication of how Good the professional care is that we've developed a social relationship and a friendship. Um, they always made me feel uh, very welcome, uh, very cared for. I sought all my medical care at UCSD and still do, as do all members of my family. And 
I think that's a credit to UCSD and the Medical Center uh, because we know we're getting expert care. We support that it's a teaching university um, so that um, interns and residents and fellows are able to learn from what they're seeing in the clinic. Uh, and they're at the leading edge of so many experimental therapies. So I think the, the Sulpizio, you know, cardiovascular center has been transformative for UCSD and um, aggregating all of the heart disciplines at Sulpizio uh, with Altman next to it. And now hopefully the Strauss Center will become an integral part as well. Uh, I'm on the uh, Council of the Cardiovascular Institute um, and have been and uh, am very um, interested and involved in its success. So hopefully the Strauss Center and the research and what we're going to accomplish uh, on learning about and treating cardiomyopathy will be part of the great success that the Cardiovascular Institute has had in the area of transplants and treating all manner of heart disease. Uh, my parents recently underwrote a chair uh, for the head of neck and spine surgery at UCSD and have made other gifts. So uh, UCSD is very important to us and it's important to me and, and my wife, Lisa, that uh, if someone has a, an event of cardiomyopathy and they ask where to get treated, in San Diego, they'll be told, oh, go to the Strauss Center at UCSD. Thank you, uh, Steve and Lisa, for that, uh, you know, wonderful gift and support. And that's just, uh, let me step away from that just a moment and I'll come back to it to highlight how important uh, that contribution and that effort on your part is to our uh, success. So you've heard from us and we're very proud of what we've achieved the last decade. We have just recently uh, re received our US News and World Report ranking. We've been consistently in the top 50. Well, now we're in the top 25. And we're very proud of the fact that we got ranked as the best uh, cardiovascular center in Hawaii, South of Orange County, Nevada, Arizona, in all of those areas, we are the number one. And whereas 10 years ago, we didn't want anybody from San Diego to have to go out of San Diego, we have turned that around a little bit where now we're looking for people around the country to come for their cardiovascular care here to UC San Diego. And that's happening more and more so by the day. The other efforts, uh, in addition to our clinical efforts, are what we do when we educate and train the next generation. And one of the things that's not uh, well appreciated is that we have over 30 trainees, 30 trainees in cardiovascular diseases, cardiology, heart transplant, interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery, cardiac anesthesiology. We are getting people from around the country who want to come and learn and train with us. And that's a huge effort, one that we're very proud of. And now people we are training are going on to form centers and programs around the country. So that's an important educational effort that's continued over the last 10 years, but we see that expanding and growing in the next 10 years. The other big direction that we see ourselves going to is our research, our clinical and translational research. So presently, our faculty gather anywhere from 25 to $30 million in extramural or NIH grant support to carry on various uh, basic investigation in cardiovascular diseases and translational care. We want clinical trials to be available to our patients because sometimes the newest and greatest and optimal therapies are only available in clinical trials and they take five or 10 years uh, to be commercially available. But we have clinical trials. Over 100 clinical trials are offered at the UCSD Cardiovascular Institute. We're also building unique programs. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, amyloid heart disease, adult congenital heart disease. These are programs that did not exist before in the city, in the county, or in the region. And now we've launched new programs specifically focused on that. And that's where uh, the 
Strauss and Wilson Center for Cardiomyopathy fits in. We are now going to be able to, with, this, with the establishment of this center, be involved in preclinical basic research, figure out why does cardiomyopathy even happen, then figure out how to come up with new therapies and bring them to our patients. Also, as part of this gift is the ability to train new uh, physicians in the treatment of cardiomyopathy. So all of that is interwoven and interlinked. And uh, so we are extremely grateful to what the Strausses have done for the institution at UC San Diego, but specifically us in the Cardiovascular Institute. Uh, I wanted to highlight that moving forward, our donors and our patients are also intertwined and interlinked with us. All of you were thankful and grateful for all the support that you've shown us over the past decade. And as we journey forward to the next five to 10 years, I think our vision is that this is and should become the preeminent cardiovascular program in the country for all three facets of academic medicine. Superb clinical care that we already deliver and we plan to expand it further. Training the next generation, just like uh, uh, Michael highlighted uh, some of the individuals who have worked hard to get us here. So uh, where it's Tony DeMaria and Stuart Jameson and Kirk Peterson were previously uh, instrumental in getting the Sulpizio off the ground and gave us the mantle to further develop it. We now want to develop it for the next generation and train the next generation. And finally, we want the ability to have innovative clinical trials, research, and unique programs, programs which may affect just a few patients, the rare patients, but they know that they can come here. So I just gave the example of amyloid heart disease. I gave the example of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We have a lipid disorders clinic. So if you have complex lipids that no one else can figure out how to get your cholesterol low, you come here, we have a unique clinic. When it comes to congenital heart disease uh, and those children that grow up to be adults and have nowhere to go, prior to us establishing our program, they had to go, the closest place was UCLA. Now, everybody south of Orange County can come here. So I'd like to finish with that and uh, once again, express my gratitude to the leadership at UC San Diego, Dr. Brenner, Patty Mason, our CEO, and uh, my partner, Michael Madani, and all of you, our patients who've joined us today and donors. And we'll have an opportunity to answer some questions. So back to you, Dr. Brenner. Thank you, thank you so much. That was great. I, I wanna thank um, both our, our speakers, but also thank um, our patients. Their stories are really, really remarkable. So, so thank you to the Connors and thank you, um, Steve Strauss. Um, so I wanted to start by giving you an opportunity to reminisce. So, so what are you both most um, proud of in, in the last 10 years? You know, I remember it's like yesterday when we broke ground for the South East York Cardiovascular Center and when it opened and I can't imagine a journey that's been more productive and has changed, you know, healthcare in the city more than what you guys have done for the, um, so, and your team has done for the South Pedro Cardiovascular Center. And, and the, the accolades you got, you know, including last week in US News and World Report, just illustrate that, just provides a little outside <laughs> objective, but anyone who's getting the care here, you know, and, and I've had many, many family members and friends have gotten their care um, under you. And they, they just raved about it. So, so I'd like you guys to both start off. Uh, maybe maybe um, Michael can go first and Shami can rest for a minute and, and go and, and then um, just say what, what you remember, what, what you're most proud of, and then we'll ask some more specific questions. I, you know, uh, that's a very good question because there are so many things to be proud of, um, you know, and I can go down the list, but what is the most, um, uh, the thing that I'm most proud of, I, you know, it always comes to the people around me, I have to say, and uh, to the faculty. Um, and, and I'm just really, really proud of the people that we have here. You know, Shami and I are very particular about people we choose um, and, um, and training the uh, people that, that we have here. And I think we've been very successful in retaining uh, top faculty. I mean, uh, th these guys get get recruited, as you well know, all the time. 
and you know big name institutions not that we're not big name but they're they're uh, getting recruited all the time and there's a reason they stay here and that's because of the culture that we have here and the collaboration that we have between particularly cardiac surgery and cardiology but it goes you know, it goes all along. Um, we mentioned pulmonary, we mentioned cardiac anesthesia, radiology, and I think it's just the people. For me, that that is the thing that I'm most proud of. And and you know, you reflect back, and I walk down the hall, and people may not know this, but I, I see faces that I've seen for the last 10, 15 years, happy, excited, like they were the first day. And I'm not exaggerating, but that's the truth. And there's a reason they stay here. And it's because of the culture that we have developed and because of the satisfaction that we get uh, providing such excellent care. Uh, and, and you heard some of the examples today. So um, I could go down the list of you know, procedures and things that were invented and were done here. But I think the bottom line for me is it comes down to the uh, people uh, within the CVI. Thank you, Shami. And starting with Shami himself. <laughs> yeah, I would say, David, uh, the, I'll reiterate. I, I think I'll, I'll answer that in two points. I think exactly what Michael said. A decade ago versus now, it, it feels like we're a big professional family. And as, as you well know, uh, there are these silos in academia and hospitals of departments and divisions and so on and so forth. That's not how we feel. We come to work. Uh, every day, all of the faculty, all of the doctors and staff and nurses and nurse practitioners and fellows. And when we walk in this building, there's a there's sort of very positive energy and enthusiasm. And I think COVID uh, particularly highlighted that. When COVID, the pandemic hit, our staff didn't call uh, for days off. We had everybody showing up to work, taking care of patients when, the, when there were so many unknowns about this virus. And so I think that collegiality enabled us to do that. The second part, and I reflect back to uh, 10 years ago, we used to have meetings at Hillcrest looking at where are patients going when they have complex cardiovascular uh, diseases and problems. And a lot of people were leaving San Diego uh, prior to 2010, going to many different places, regionally and nationally. And 10 years later, that I would say from a patient standpoint is our uh, source of great pride to me that those patients don't have to leave San Diego. They're coming to UCSD, including from other health systems in the county, in the city, uh, but also beyond. Thank you. Um, th then there are a couple of very specific questions about your talks, about the talks at the, um, the testimonies that the O'Connors and Steve Strauss brought up. So, so, um, so the, two, the two obvious, you know, that we didn't say in detail, Someone once, says, a couple of people said, what actually is a cardiomyopathy? <laughs> and I, I will leave that to Shami. And then, and then when that's done, um, someone wanted more description about the PTE. What actually do you do to take the scar tissue out of the lung? So we'll start with Shami and then get back to Michael. Sure. So cardiomyopathy, if you look at it from the broadest terms, is any disease that affects the heart muscle. And so it can be a virus. It can be a genetic disorder of the uh, muscle cells. It can be because somebody had had two or three heart attacks, and now the heart muscle that's used to squeeze normally uh, has become weak and is not squeezing as well. So depending on the cause of a cardiomyopathy, the treatment can be medications. It can be open up the blockages in the heart so that uh, and the heart arteries so we can restore cardiac function or in an extreme or advanced example, it can actually be heart transplantation, all of which we now offer at UCSD. Michael? Yeah, so the um, PT operation, as I described the condition um, where we have scar forming within the vessels, uh, if you think about scar tissue, think of it as any scar that you may have on your body. So when, when you get an injury, you know, first there's clot, then it becomes scab, and it's easy enough to wipe off the clot. It's easy enough maybe to peel at the scab. But once it becomes scar, um, that's almost impossible to remove because in order to remove it, you have to remove a layer of skin with it. 
And that's what we're doing inside the pulmonary vessels. So the reason this operation is challenging is because we're operating on vessels that are uh, paper, uh, tissue, you know, thin, and um, but they have multiple layers. And in order to remove the inner layer, you can't just remove the scar. You have to remove um, the inner lining of the artery with it, with the clot or with the scar tissue inside it. Uh, that makes it very challenging because these arteries are very delicate and you can't obviously injure the artery. But more so, in order to do the operation, you have to cool the patient down quite a bit. And for periods of time, um, you have to completely stop the circulation and drain the blood out of the body. So this is what's unique with this particular operation, unlike any other open heart surgery, is that we stop the heart-lung machine. And for periods of time, there is no blood flow. There's no blood actually in the body at all. Um, and then at, when we're done, we rewarm the body. So th this is what makes it more complex, but really the technique of endarterectomy, which is removal of that scar tissue inner lining um, is what allows the vessels to open up again and for the patients to be able to breathe. But when, when Michael is showing me pictures of the casts from the surgeries, I'm amazed. It looks like the entire pulmonary system, vas the vascular system is involved behind the because this clock that forms behind the, behind the scars. Absolutely, everybody's a little different. Sometimes patients have a, you know, little clots that, that travel into smaller branches. Sometimes people have bigger clots, sometimes uh, is what you describe. Um, while we're on the topic, I saw a question, um, it's easy enough to answer. Somebody was asking about switching from Coumadin to Eliquis. Yes, yes, and that, that just, was my next question, please. Yeah, yes. so I just, you know, we don't have any data um, but we feel that it's safe to switch um, after a year or two years, but we don't really have any data. If somebody does not tolerate Coumadin, um, Eliquis is one of the newer generation of blood thinners. They were asking what has changed. Well, it's just that they're available now and they're a lot easier to manage and handle than Coumadin. Uh, but if somebody cannot tolerate Coumadin and they've probably more than a couple of years um, they should consult their physicians and, and see if it's safe for them to switch. But we feel that it may be okay. Yeah. So that's that for PTs. Maybe, Shami, you want to say Eliquis for other conditions in which warfarin has traditionally been used. Yeah, and I think from a cardiovascular standpoint, atrial fibrillation is the big one. Right. And, and uh, the advantages of Eliquis, or what I'll call NOAX, is that uh, you don't have to get regular uh, INR checks and they are very predictable. So your risk of bleeding actually is lower because you don't get super high anticoagulation. The one time where uh, I would not recommend it is if you have a mechanical heart valve, then you really need to stay on Coumadin. That's not where we have good data. But aside from that, virtually in all situations, we switch patients nowadays preferentially treat them with the newer generation agents. Yeah, and the third intervention that people asked about in the questions was a, um, a um, um, IVC filter you know, as, as another way. Where, where would that fit in compared to Coumadin and Eliquis? Yeah, filters are becoming um, less and less common, mainly because of some of the problems that uh, patients may have uh, long-term. And it's early that we use uh, filters. As a general rule, filters are used um, when patients have blood clots, in particular in, in their legs or in their pelvis. And for one reason or another, you cannot anticoagulate them. And then you don't really have a choice uh, and you want to prevent those clots to travel to the lungs. So that, that will be a, uh, an indication. We used to put filters on all our patients who, had, uh, who were undergoing uh, PT surgery. But several years ago, based on the experiences of our colleagues uh, from Europe, we decided that we don't really need to do that for every patient. Um, and otherwise, uh, as I mentioned, really the, real, the, the current indications are you would use a filter if somebody cannot be anticoagulated or if they have recurrent thrombotic issues despite anticoagulation uh, and their high risk of uh, uh, pulmonary emboli. Those are really the only times we would use filters. Thank you. Um, 
the past 18 months, everything's changed with the COVID-19 pandemic. What has changed in cardiovascular medicine? Um, one of our concerns was that because of fear of coming to the hospital, people would delay their care, that they would have chest pain that normally would bring them to the um, emergency medicine, but they did not come because they were concerned. Could you, could you, um, both of you, maybe Shami first can address that. Yeah, so I think that's a great question, David, and it's uh, really impacted uh, cardiovascular care quite dramatically. Um, if you look around the country, patients are showing up later than usual, having cardiac symptoms, and what happened, especially when they're having heart attacks and small heart attacks, and what happens is by the time they're showing to the hospital, we're seeing complications that we have essentially have dis had disappeared. For example, uh, a hole in the heart that forms after a heart attack or a muscle in the heart that ruptures. And now we have to deal with that mechanical problem. So that had started to increase uh, with a broader nat you know, national education campaign, uh, people are becoming more comfortable with coming back for their healthcare. And so hopefully that is not a bad byproduct of COVID that will last. The second part is COVID itself, the disease itself can affect two aspects of the heart, actually three aspects. It can affect the lining of the heart, cause a pericarditis and inflammation. It can affect the muscle of the heart, cause a myocarditis or a cardiomyopathy. And third thing, it can make more clots in the arteries itself and lead to a heart attack. So those are the three risks of COVID associated uh, cardiac condition all of which, of course, patients need to come to the hospital to get optimal care. Uh, can we prevent it? The earlier you show up in a hospital, the easier we can treat it. And so, yes, we can treat them, these conditions, but though there are the direct effects of COVID and then the indirect uh, effects of COVID where patients delay care, they don't have COVID, but they just don't want to come into the hospital. And then we have to deal with the delayed presentations. Thank you. Michael, this is also related to the answering this question now, was um, patients who are immunocompromised, um, sorry, immunosuppressed, such as heart transplant patients, are they a particular risk um, if they get um, if they get COVID-19? Yeah, uh, I think they, they are um, uh, at a higher risk of potential um, uh, acquiring COVID to begin with if they're exposed and potentially having high risk of pulmonary problems. So if you're even a suppressor, you have to be particularly careful with um, you know, the guidelines essentially, uh, but you are at a higher risk of uh, acquiring it. And if you get it, you're at higher risk of potentially having complications. And also I think that um, your response to vaccination is not it's, as good. Exactly. And you're, Exactly. And that's the other point that uh, you could get vaccinated, but you may not have, you shouldn't feel as comfortable as somebody who's not immunocompromised uh, if you're vaccinated. So you should continue to have uh, to, to have all the precautions that we, we recommend, masking, social distancing, and so on. Thank you. Um, Shami mentioned this, but there are some follow-up questions about um, um, cardiac amyloidosis and what, it, uh, and there are the new therapies and then maybe Michael can address the role of heart transplant and, and amyloidosis. Shami? Yeah, th there are new therapies. Uh, we have also gotten more effective in making the diagnosis faster. So it, uh, aside from doing cardiac biopsy, which was uh, sort of the gold right. standard, but there are uh, uh, blood tests we can do. There are pyrophosphate scans, non-invasive imaging on echo as well. So first, we can diagnose amyloid heart disease much more easily than we could have in years past. And secondly, there are now new therapies, both FDA approved and investigational to help prevent progression of amyloid heart disease. And I think this is important for me to uh, point out that we now have an amyloid disease clinic at UCSD. Uh, Tony Uri runs that program. And uh, we, very, we have very focused uh, diagnoses uh, diagnostic approaches and therapeutics for amyloid heart disease at UCSD. And Michael can answer the transplant question. Yeah, I mean, if it gets, uh, Shami has pointed out, um, uh, if it gets to a point that um, uh, the disease is significantly restrictive and patient has developed a significant restrictive cardiomyopathy that's non-responsive to any of the treatments, of course, the, the um, ultimate treatment will be transplantation. Uh, 
uh, and and here at our institution, you know, uh, a really good experience and good result with the cardiac transplantation in amyloid uh, patients. There's some general questions about um, heart transplantation. I think because of the remarkable results you're getting, um, and um, so, some of the questions are sort of like, what's the future of heart transplant heart transplants in, at UC San Diego? Um, what are the indications? Um, who, who takes care of the transplant patients? What kind of team of doctors? It's a multidisciplinary team uh, that performs the transplants and uh, takes care of them. The team is led by Dr. Victor Pretorius on the surgical side. Uh, he actually performs a vast majority of transplants and that's uh, one of the reasons for success as the volume was low. We wanted to make sure that we have consistency and um, all of us do perform it, but very um, um, rarely nowadays. It's mainly Dr. Pretorius and Dr. Kearns who perform the um, heart transplants. The indications, of course, vary, and it comes down to end stage um, heart failure where, where there are no other options and there's no medical uh, treatment. Uh, patient may or may not be a candidate for uh, mechanical circuitry support. Those are little artificial pumps that we can put in. Um, and uh, you know, any given situation, if you get a, if you could get a transplant versus a mechanical circuitry support, and you're a good candidate, that will be uh, preferred. Um, once the transplant is performed, it's really our cardiac, uh, our critical care anesthesia team. Uh, and the cardiology team, the heart failure and transplant team, who takes care of those patients in the ICU and after the ICU, along with the surgeon. So it's a, a really well-oiled, multidisciplinary team that takes care of these patients as inpatient, as well as as outpatient. And that's really the reason we see the success that um, uh, we currently see. And um, uh, the other question, what was the other question? Um, the indications. I'm sorry? Sorry, indications. Yeah, indications, like I said, it's really end-stage um, uh, heart failure uh, for one reason or another that's not response, responding to uh, other uh, forms of medical therapy. I, I think uh, uh, you've outlined the indications, Michael. So somebody whose heart muscle is so weak, they cannot adequately pump blood to their body. So their blood pressure is low and they're pretty advanced. Uh, from the standpoint of the team, uh, I should mention that we have eight transplant cardiologists at UCSD. So it's one of the largest transplant cardiology groups and uh, they see thousands of patients in clinic and they manage all the patients uh, pre and post procedure. So in addition to Dr. Pretorius, we have Dr. Eric Adler, who's the medical director of the heart transplant program. And then there's a whole series of uh, other faculty members. And uh, all of this in the acute phase, meaning when the transplant occurs is when the patient's in the hospital. But of course, once you're transplanted, uh, you have to take care of the patients for years on end. I should mention, Michael said, uh, when we started, we wanted to concentrate the volume because we were a low volume program. Well, now we're one of the highest volume programs in the United States. So uh, with, with the best, so not only do we have amongst the best outcomes, number two in outcomes, we're also, I believe, we range between number three and four in overall volumes of heart yeah. transplants in the United States. So uh, very large yeah. program in volume and uh, op in outcomes. I remember the question, Dr. Brenner, David, uh, and that was the future of transplantation, yes. future of heart transplantation. So we all dream of a day that you could you could take somebody's tissue and just grow cells in the lab and then grow uh, their heart. Um, but um, that's that's uh, long ways in coming. But that's that's really the dream. And what's happening right now? Traditionally, when we do heart transplant, the team goes they. Um, procure the heart, preserve it, and put it in essentially an ice bucket, for lack of a better word, and then they bring it back and transplant the, um, the heart, uh, hoping that that period is not too long. And that only happens when the patient is essentially brain dead, is declared brain dead. But one of the newer um, ways of, um, and, and as everybody knows, we have limitations with donors. 
And one of the newer ways is what we call um, donors donation after cardiac death. And in that situation, for all practical purposes, a uh, patient does not have any survivable um, brain activity, but there may be some low level activity and the patient goes to the operating room. Typically right now, we would send a team with heart lung machine. And what happens in the operating room, uh, the pay, they allow the patient to see if they breathe on their own and they wait until the heart stops practically. And if that happens and it lasts a few minutes, then they can revive that heart after the heart is, is essentially dead and revive it using the heart lung machine and actually put it in a machine. Uh, uh, it's called uh, the transmedic device where it supports the heart and you can transfer the heart. You could, you could watch it see if the heart is functioning and then transplant the, uh, uh, that donated heart, uh, which is amazing. It, it, it was something that you could not think of like five, six years ago, but it's increased the number of donations. We have time for a couple more questions. And there are a lot of questions about atrial fibrillation, ablation, and um, anticoagulation. So let, let me start with, with, with Shami. It's a very common problem now. It is a very common problem and continuing to increase. So if you have a successful ablation and you stay in sinus rhythm, then yes, that's one of the ways to get off anticoagulation. But it has to be successful and if you maintain in sinus rhythm. So I see that as being one of the questions. Yeah. Uh, should uh, And I think whether or not an individual uh, person should contemplate ablation Depends obviously on your circumstances. Sometimes the size of the left atrium will dictate the success and long-term success. And I think uh, that's a difficult question for me to answer. It's an individual level question, but I would say that if your atrium is not massively dilated and you would like to be off anticoagulation, uh, it's certainly something to contemplate. If you have atrial flutter, on the other hand, you should absolutely get that ablated because that is a treatable, a curable uh, at, uh, heart rhythm. Here's a fun question to end on. Um, someone wanted to know, what are we missing at the South PGL Cardiovascular Center? If you're the wish list, what would you, what would you like us to, uh, to do next? Michael and then Shami. Uh, wish list, a second building, a new, <laughs> a new <laughs> <laughs> just expand, you know? Uh, that's a really good question. And uh, I, I don't think there is, really anything that's, I know there isn't anything out there that we're not offering and we're offering it. I just really wish that we could um, be able to offer it to a lot more patients that we can right now. A lot of times we're limited by space. So our wish list, as you are very well aware, is, is expansion. Yeah, so I'll, I'll second that. We started, the Sulpizio had 54 beds. We've been allocated additional beds in the Thorn. We're close to about 90 uh, committed beds to the cardiovascular program at UCSD. And we uh, exceed that on a regular basis, but which means we're sort of limited by space. We see ourselves as the Mayo, as the Cleveland Clinic. And that means we need probably three times the number of beds. That would be one. The second part, and uh, the example of Steve Strauss is a great one, is we need resources to expand our training programs and to retain, not just recruit, but retain our best faculty. They get uh, offers all over the country all the time. And for us to be able to retain them, uh, we have to offer them something beyond uh, what they currently have. And often those retention packages include uh, giving them more discretionary support to be able to uh, chase their academic dreams, come up with new innovations, new ideas, new companies to potentially found. And, and our faculty have done all of those things. So I think in the next 10 years, uh, it would it will be all of those things. We, we want to be bigger, uh, broader, and we want to innovate more. We want to be the place that establishes new therapeutics and offers it to not just our patients, but ones around the country. All right. On that note, I want to thank both of you. I want to thank the patients who contributed. And we're all very excited to see what you guys do in the next 10 years. Thank you much, very much. Congratulations on your 10th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brenner. Thank you.